So if you have clicked on this video or you've been told to watch this video, I think you understand that we are going to be talking about biodiversity, or at least introducing this concept. Now, if we're to take this term and split it apart and look at these two components individually, I think we can simply state that diversity just means the variety of things. When we take a look at bio, though, it's not quite as simple to dissect exactly what that means. Yes, I think we can take a look at bio and stem it from the Greek bios, which means life, but the problem we run into is, what defines life? Well, if you are looking for a definitive explanation of what life is or how we define life, you're not going to find it here. But I can give you some characteristics that we can generally associate with something being defined as a living thing. So the first thing is that living things have to display some form of organization. The components or structures that make them up have to have, or should have, specific functions. Another requirement is they have to require some form of energy. They should show evidence that they respond to stimuli in their environment, meaning I'm going to move toward, or maybe away from, this source of light. Living organisms should demonstrate growth and development. They should show the capacity to reproduce. They should show an ability to adapt or change in response to their environment. And they should be made up of one or more cells. So now what I want you to do is take these seven characteristics and see if you can come up with a list of as many living things that fit these seven characteristics as you can. Go ahead, pause the video, and, and try it out. You, you, didn't, you didn't do that, did you? Or, or if you did, kudos, um, probably used up most of your afternoon. But we have characterized or classified almost two million different living things. But then the question could be extended to how many living things do we actually believe there are, characterized or otherwise? Well, here's a choice. You've got three numbers over here. Which one of these do you think is the one that we currently believe to be the most accurate. Did you answer A? B? C? Well, depending on how you look at it, they're either all right or they're all wrong. You see, the ranges that we have, depending on the methodologies that are used, identify the number of living things on this planet as being as low as 5 million and as being as high as 1 trillion. Now, those are big numbers, but to put that into perspective, let's imagine you walk into a shoe store and you find a pair of shoes that you really like. And so you talk to the salesperson and you say, well, how much are those? And they say, well, that depends. They're either $5 or they're $1 million. Now, that's quite a range. Part of the problem that we run into is that we have an issue with defining what a species is. Now, traditionally, when we talk about a species that is identifying or categorizing a living thing, we generally identify it as two organisms that can procreate or mate and give rise to viable offspring. So part of the problem with coming up with a definition, a concrete definition for what a species is, is that nature doesn't abide by our understanding. We observe nature and try and come up with our constructs, our own understandings, our own definitions. For example, if we're talking about species as being those that can successfully interbreed, let's just take a look at an example of a dog and a wolf. We generally tend to think of these two things as being two different species, and yet they can breed successfully and produce viable offspring. What about those organisms that uh, don't go through sexual reproduction at all? There are many microorganisms, plants, uh, some lizards, fish, that don't necessarily go through sexual reproduction, so how do we define those? Sometimes we have to think about the morphology of those organisms. That is what they look like. But then we run into trouble when we look at species like humans that have a large amount of genetic variability. So if we saw a human that had blonde hair and a human that had brown hair, the temptation would, if we treated them, say, the way that we identify plants, is that those two individuals are of different species, when in fact it's just genetic variability within that species. So you see, we run into a whole bunch of different problems that come up when we start to identify or when we try to identify species based on concrete characteristics. So as a result, there are somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 definitions for what a species is. Now while we may not be able to agree on what a species is, or even how many species or living things we have on this planet, what is agreed upon is that biodiversity is a good thing. 
The more organisms that we have in a particular ecosystem, the greater number of interactions they can have within an ecosystem. And as a result, the greater likelihood there is that if an organism is removed for whatever reason, there will be other organisms that can move in and take their place. That is, another organism can move in and fill that missing organism's niche. And we're not just talking about diversity of the living things in there, we are also talking about things called structural diversity. That is, the more robust ecosystems generally have a whole bunch of different microhabitats that are available for a variety of organisms. For example, if we think about a meadow, there's far more microhabitats there than there are in a monoculture like your front lawn, where there's only maybe one type of grass and a certain number of uh, microorganisms in the soil and a certain number of insects. That limits the interactions that can happen within and on your front lawn versus those that might happen in a meadow ecosystem. So if we think about those interactions, those things could include things like the food availability, the interaction between predator and prey, the availability of protection, not only by other organisms, but also for shelter. Transportation, if we think about some seeds that might be found in that meadow ecosystem, they need to attach to organisms to be transported from one place to another. There's certainly reproduction. The more organisms that can interact of the same species, the more likely they are to successfully reproduce. And in some ecosystems, the interaction between organisms improves their hygiene. There are some organisms that remove harmful bacteria and viruses from the surfaces and sometimes even the inner surfaces of other organisms. And if talking about those microorganisms and interactions within, we can think about digestion as well. Think about your gut flora that help digest some of the material that would not be digested otherwise. Now, quite often the problem that we run into when we study ecology or when we study ecosystems and we study living things and we study biology as a whole is we tend to stand back and try and observe the entire thing as if we're some type of external observer. But that couldn't be further from the truth. We too are living things. We too are involved in these interactions with the environment. And so what we need to understand is the greater the amount of biodiversity that we have on this planet, the greater number of interactions we are going to have as well, and the greater success we are going to have as a species. We rely on these organisms, not just for pets or for food supply, but also with all the natural products that we rely on, also the medications that we rely on, those that we know about and those that have yet to be discovered. If we limit the interactions, if we limit the biodiversity, we're limiting our own success as a species. So hopefully after you've watched this video, you have maybe a little better understanding of what biodiversity means, but also have a greater appreciation for why a large amount of biodiversity on this planet is important. Thanks for watching.